Okay, you guys got your Bibles? One person's got their Bible, that's cool. Uh, whatever. Well, church, we are just 363 sleeps away from Christmas. That is exciting. Uh, you'll notice we still have the Christmas stage set up. We were playing Christmas music on the way in. And that is because we are not done, uh, church. Typically, or often, uh, the Christmas season, um, pretty quickly after Christmas Day, we tend to transition into the next thing, straight after Christmas Day. Uh, for many people, uh, New Year's Eve has already captured their attention. Uh, there are going to be some people on Christmas Eve who are going to live like an absolute maniac uh, after coming to church on the 25th. Excuse me, I'm coughing away here. Hopefully none of those people, by the way, are here. I actually have a water here, Kim, if that's how you're trying to help me, which is very sweet of you. It probably wasn't what she was doing, and now she... She has to pretend that was what she was going to go do. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> uh, I'll try and... I think I'm okay. All right. And so, for many people, um, we move on pretty quick from Christmas. Now, maybe there are some of you that are still reveling in the joy of some gift you got. Uh, maybe you're still pretty pumped about, uh, you know, new golf club or something else rather meaningless. But for the most part... <laughs> We, we move on pretty quick, like that, the, the Christmas tree isn't special anymore, we kind of, we look at it and think, ah, well, he doesn't need water, he'll be fine, and uh, that's kind of just what tends to happen uh, in our culture and in our minds as well, and so I want to, I thought it would be a good idea to continue the Christmas story and give attention to a part of the story that is often overlooked, the moment after Christmas Day, there was a after-the-manger moment, which is still part of Christmas, and I thought, well, this would be very appropriate to talk about that this morning. Uh, on Thursday, uh, at our Christmas Eve service, I shared a little bit, uh, I read, I think I did, from Luke 2, and read the story of the shepherds making their way to the manger, uh, but then I just, I stopped the story right when they got to the manger, I just came to an abrupt stop, and so we're going to pick up where we left off. What happened after they got to the manger? So please turn with me in your Bibles uh, to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, so the third book. I think most of you know that. That was patronizing, wasn't it? In the New Testament. Okay, let's have a look here. Let's read from verses 8 to 20. It'll be up on the screens for you. You ready? All right, let's light this candle. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased." When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they have heard and seen as it had been told to them. Okay. So the first thing that happened after the angels had visited 
these shepherds and made this announcement as they very quickly made their way to Bethlehem. So the shepherds leave to Bethlehem. It says, when the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see the thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. Now, I touched on this last week. Um, It's probably worth restating. It is uh, not without significance that God chose shepherds to announce the birth of his son. Uh, It would have been... it wouldn't have been appropriate to have announced it to the religious leaders of the day, for they were very haughty, very prideful people, and that would be inappropriate for the humble arrival of the long-awaited king. And in the ancient world, a shepherd was a noble and heroic occupation. And that shifted a little bit when we came into the second temple period. More wealthy people came to Jerusalem. And what it was to be a shepherd became a low rung on the social ladder, which is a shame because shepherding actually had a really crucial role in society. For they overwatched and protected the sacrifices The very animals that were sacrificed to to atone for sin, that was their job. And so it was a rather important role that these lowly outcasts had been, that that shepherding had been perceived as, or uh, socially people didn't respect them as much as some of these other jobs. And so after all, who better to announce the arrival of Jesus than to shepherds, because remember we, from the Old Testament, it was the lamb from Passover that would be sacrificed. Remember the story of Passover when Israel were delivered from uh, Egypt the night before they left? God said to Israel, said to Moses, take a lamb, put its blood over the doorpost, and on that night, the death angel will pass over you, right? That's what the Passover lamb was. And of course, as we know, Jesus is God's Passover lamb, the sacrifice, that if we apply the blood of Christ onto our hearts, then our sin will be dealt with. And so God's Passover lamb, of course, you are going to announce the birth, the arrival to shepherds. That makes complete sense. So let's take a few moments to appreciate what this encounter must have been like for these shepherds. Uh, After experiencing an overwhelming and fearful um, moment with a team of angels, they made their way to Bethlehem, to the manger, to see or to find the Son of God. So first of all, can you imagine that conversation between these shepherds? It was late at night. The angels came down and said that they had fear The word in Greek is phobos, where we get the word phobia. So they were overwhelmed. They were fearful, and rightly so. And then there was a a multitude of angels. And we don't know how many, but it wasn't a half a dozen, surely. And so then the angels, gone, back to the still of the night. And they just looked at each other and said, well, I guess we should head to Bethlehem. Let's go. And you could imagine the conversations they were having when they were walking there. You know one of them said at some point, okay, look, just just so I'm not going crazy, did we all see the same thing? That wasn't just me, right? You guys saw like a a, a crew of angels that went down? So that is how they're having to process this. This literally happened to them, and they had to experience that. So this overwhelming supernatural event um, came their way, and... uh, I can't help but wonder what happened to their flock, because remember, they were overseeing a flock. And uh, so they left their flock unattended, which means probably some wolves had a wonderful evening that evening, (laughs) devouring the sheep that had been unattended. So the shepherds respond swiftly and soon arrive in Bethlehem. Verse 11, for unto you is born this day in the city of of David, a savior, who is the Christ, the Lord. Okay, the city of David. The city of David is another name for Bethlehem. Uh, Because you'll notice that the angel said, 
uh, that there would be one in a swaddling cloth in, the, cloth in the city of David. And then the angel said, well, let us go to Bethlehem. It was, the, it was a synonymous term. It was another name for the same region. Now, the reason why Bethlehem shares its name with the city of David was because uh, Bethlehem was the birthplace of King David. Now, not to mention, he was anointed as king at Bethlehem. So that's why the Jewish people, who remembering their lineage is just so important, call it the city of David. But why is that important? Why is that interesting? Well, God promised David, the first, David, King David was the first rightful king of Israel. He promised David that his throne would be established forever. That was a promise that God made to King David. Your throne will be established forever. God made this covenant with David, and you, and you can read about this if you want to make a note of it and you want to learn more about the, this promise or this covenant that God made with David in 2 Samuel chapter 7. So David was promised that one of his offspring would rule forever. Okay, that's, that's important. Uh, additionally, we see this in Isaiah. We see it in Jeremiah. I'll just mention a couple of verses here, just kind of, I don't know, maybe kind of excite your thinking about the prophetic element of Jesus being born in Bethlehem, the city of David. Isaiah 11, there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse. Uh, I mean, I'm just pulling this verse out of the passage. And obviously, who's Jesse? It's David's dad, right? Okay, uh, Jeremiah 23, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. Okay, so Jesus is the stump. He is the, uh, the branch. He is the offshoot of King David. Uh, and, and those two verses are just many of hundreds of verses that speak of the coming Messiah. And, and keep in mind that um, both Joseph and Mary are from the lineage of David as well. So numerous times in the Gospels, in particular Matthew, or maybe only Matthew, I have to fact check me on that actually, <laughs> I should have researched that before I got up here this morning. In the book of Matthew, five times Jesus is called the son of David. The son of David is a messianic title. In fact, in Matthew's Gospel, uh, let's just read it, uh, chapter 1, verse 1, this is how the whole New Testament's going to kick off. First verse, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, son of Abraham. So it matters. It matters that Jesus is the son of David. It matters that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, the city of David, because God made a covenant with David that there would be one, an offshoot, that would reign forever. And we know that's Jesus. So that is with some significance that Jesus was born in the city of David. And I doubt that the angels were surprised to hear. Uh, one last prophecy, just because it's cool. Micah chapter 5. But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is the ruler of Israel, whose coming forth is from the old, from ancient of days. Back in Micah, chapter 5, Old Testament, we are told that the son of David, Jesus, was going to be born in Bethlehem. That's pretty cool. That's epic. So there are dozens of prophecies that strengthen this point. And so it's, it's just not a, trivial, it's not, not, not a trivial thing that Jesus was born in the city of David. Now, the city of David is probably about six miles away from Jerusalem, uh, there are some speculated exact locations where they think maybe the shepherds were. Um, there are some people that claim they know where the manger is. I, I think we're kind of reaching on some of these points. But it's going to be about six miles, which means it's going to be probably about a 60 to 90 minute walk, depending on the terrain. And remember, they it said they made haste. They were swiftly doing this. So they would have had the fast walking going. Uh, they wouldn't have been meandering around and... Uh, so they made their way. I don't know why I did kind of that. It's, it made no point. Didn't add to the story to have the actions. But they hurried. They made their way to Bethlehem, and they arrived. Now, Luke 2, 16, it says, And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and baby lying in a manger. 
So they found him. Sure enough, just as the angels had said, Mary, Joseph, and a baby, and a manger, and a swaddling cloth. Now, often in Scripture, when we read stories, sometimes um, some of the emotions or the experience that some of the people in the story, sometimes it's not mentioned. And that's just partly the nature of a historical account. The, we, we can't capture everyone's emotions and experience, especially with the, the non-essential players in the story, because at the end of the day, what we're going to read in the story it need to be the most prominent essential points. And so with that, we kind of miss a little bit of the... the our imagination just needs a little bit more sometimes. So let's just, again, try and get into the scene. It's been late at night. The shepherds were overseeing their lambs. Some angels showed up, so that's a big deal. They kind of freak out. This is a big moment, so they make their way over to Bethlehem. Would have taken about an hour, hour and a half. You know, one of the shepherds was slower than the other, and that would have been kind of a little bit irritating. Come on, too many shawamas or whatever it is you eat. And they finally made their way to the manger, and sure enough, they find Jesus. They find Mary and Joseph. Well, you know, Mary and Joseph were probably a little bit surprised by the late night, early morning visitors. And they walked in, and for the first time, they looked upon God, the incarnate God. Now, they, might have, they surely had some kind of anxiousness or anticipation with this moment. Remember their last spiritual encounter a couple hours earlier? They left them in fear. What were they to expect when they looked into the manger, into the arms of Mary, to fixate, to get their eyes on the Son of God? Now, surely, I mean, I speculate with this, but surely they swapped angel stories, <laughs> right? Mary, Joseph, and the shepherds, and Jesus, they've all seen angels. So that would have been a talking point, and I'm sure they were talking about the similarities of them and like, okay, so what happened? Yeah, it was scary, right? Just the one angel? Oh, we had a whole multitude. You know, that, that moment surely would have gone down. Now, worth noting, I don't know if this is a side note or I don't know if this is a useful point, but it possibly, it was possibly the same angel that visited Mary, Joseph, and the shepherds. Why? Because in the Bible, uh, there are three main angels that are mentioned by name. There's actually four. There's one in Revelation uh, that's mentioned, but he's not as common. But three main angels. Uh, one was Lucifer. The other was Gabriel. And the other was Michael, right? We've probably heard of all of those. So Michael is the warrior angel. Every time there was spiritual warfare, spiritual combat, uh, Mike was deployed. He's the one who's going to handle that. And we see him back in Daniel getting entangled in spiritual warfare. Gabriel was a messenger angel. He was the one that was entrusted to deliver uh, several important messages on behalf of God. And so it is likely that it was Gabriel that appeared to all of them. And so that's just kind of a cool thought to think about. And so I'm sure their testimonies of their experience would have had some similarities. Okay, so their journey began looking for the Messiah, the shepherds, that is. And after looking upon God incarnate and witnessing the fulfillment of what the angels had announced, let's see what happened next. Luke chapter 2, verse 17. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that they had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary, she treasured up these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, as it had been told to them. The lives of these shepherds have been changed forever. They didn't just, I mean, I, we don't know, obviously. We, we can assume that their lives were turned upside down. These shepherds surely followed the ministry of Jesus. They probably kept an eye on him, watching him grow up, when he would come to Jerusalem, when he would come to temple. Likely, they remained friends with Mary and Joseph. These shepherds' lives were impacted in a way that changed their life forever. Uh, sadly, well, for 
for them, they may have had to grieve as they watched this very same child 30 years later be sacrificed and deal with that excruciating, torturous death. These are the people that were there in the manger to see this innocent, sweet babe to being tortured 30 years later. They were likely there. Now, I'm inferring that. The scripture doesn't say that those shepherds were there, but why wouldn't they be? And so their lives were changed forever, and it says that they went out and gave praise and honor about Jesus. Okay, so I share all this to set up just two points that I want to make this morning as we are on the heels of Christmas. The two points uh, that I want to share with you, I want you to consider. Firstly, we are to make known the truth. We are to make the truth known, just like these shepherds did. Verse 17, and when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning the child. See, I, I, I deliberately didn't just say we need to make Jesus known. We need to make known all of God's truth. We, meet, we need to make known the things that have been revealed to us. Uh, each of us actually have that Christian duty and, and privilege to do so. And I, I think it's easy uh, to be a genuine, you need to be genuine about God and to forsake that responsibility to make him known. We, when those shepherds left, they weren't done. They had a task. They got deployed to Bethlehem, and then they were to go and make it known throughout all the land, thinking probably not even twice about their flock of sheep as to what happened with them. And let's just hope that a wolf didn't eat them. Let's just assume another shepherd thought, hey, unattended sheep, I'll keep those. So it was a happy ending for those sheep. Matthew 5 says this, You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. We must do as the shepherds did. They didn't have this experience the angels visited, they saw Jesus and the city of David, hundreds, thousands of years of prophecy being fulfilled. This is the pinnacle of that moment. And they just put a little basket over that story. Let's not give praise and glory and make this well known. No, I'm sure they told everybody that they crossed paths with. I read to you on Thursday night, I mentioned that Jesus was, you know, the light of the world. Well, now that we are in him, we are to be the light. We are to make these things known. And it's really easy just to get into our routine as Christians. We hang out with the same people. We come to church, go to the same small group. It's really easy just to have that out of our mind, out of our thinking, to forget about the true meaning, to forget their responsibility, to make it known to everybody. And I think if we do that, I don't think we are shy to talk about Jesus because we're ashamed. I just think that we maybe have just forgotten what our Savior has done in and through us. Maybe we need to do what Mary did. Maybe we need to meditate and ponder the things. What does it say? Verse 19, uh, but Mary treasured up all these things. So everything that she had just experienced, everything that the story of the angels, the, her visitation of the angel, this moment, she treasured it all up. And in her heart, and she pondered these things. Maybe we need to do what Mary did in our faith. Because I think if we did, if we did ponder these things, when I think about who I used to be, when I think about the way I thought, when I thought about what it was to not have Christ when I was young, and now what I have, when I think about how God's transformed me, or when I think about God's grace, what I think about what my experience is to now be in Christ, that should stir up an excitement and a desire to want to make that known. And I think that for many people, we've forgotten to do that. The message of the Messiah has been entrusted to us. It is not 
the ministry of angels. It is in God's design that we would be the ones to share everything we have heard and seen. That's, that's our job. And so we don't want to just move on from Christmas as if it happened a couple of days ago and now it's 363 more sleeps until we have to think about this again or the story keeps on going. It is those who have experienced the Savior, us, who are the best adapted to proclaim its truth. We're the, we're the best people to do this. Now keep in mind in the story, the shepherds, became preachers. I mean, things changed. Their lives were never the same. And consider the landscape in which they were were teaching as well. Uh, Likely, in in Jerusalem, there was some murmur about the incident that had happened with Zacharias. Remember Jesus' cousin, John, John the Baptist, and his dad? Remember when uh, I've got to quickly cram a story in here. Remember when Zacharias went into the temple and he got, had a vision and he couldn't speak? He was silenced until his son was born? That story was out there. And everybody heard that story and they're thinking, hmm, okay. And now the angel, uh, sorry, not the angels, the shepherds, now they're out and about. They're telling their story. And everybody is hearing all this and they're piecing it together. They're like, okay, so John the Baptist... That vision happened with his dad. Okay, so this guy was born in the city of David. Hmm. Some angels say they saw, sorry, some shepherds said they saw angels. So much, and they're so convinced they saw angels, they abandoned their flock. Something's going on. So that's, the, that's who the shepherds are preaching to. That's the climate, right? And you know that annoyed Herod, because King Herod he was threatened by this, so you think this likely, this likely contributed to why he wanted to have all the males under two killed, because he was threatened by this. Of all that chatter, the effective ministry of these shepherds, the story that was being made known. So that's something that is our responsibility too. Maybe you're an accountant, maybe you're a dairyman, maybe you work at Starbucks, whatever it is, you are also a preacher of the story. So this injunction that the witnesses of Christ carry, it does require that we have some understanding. That's why it's so important that we understand who Christ is and what he has done and what that means because that excites the story, that populates the story, that gives us the testimony that we are to declare. The shepherds made known what the angels had said, and what they had experienced, and we are to do the same. Now, verse 20 goes on to read, uh, and the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. So point two is that we are to give praise and glory to God. So point one is, if we're going to learn anything from these shepherds, One, as they went out there and they made the truth known, firstly. Second of all, they gave all praise and glory to God. So what do we mean by giving glory or praise and glory to God? To be honest, it feels a little bit uh, Christianese to say that. uh, This doesn't mean that um, you... Giving praise and glory doesn't mean that you suddenly do all the most kind of eccentric, quirky things that you can do, whatever things you can kind of muster up to be a flamboyant Christian all of a sudden. And I think... (coughs) Sorry, I was hoping that Kim would have got me a water by now, but she she hasn't. (coughs) Fine, I'll drink this one. It's, it's amazing how self-conscious you get when you have to drink water in front of a crowd of people. <laughs> I don't, I don't, it's just as bad to turn my back while I'm doing it, isn't it? So, Okay. Okay, where are we at? What are we talking about? Okay. So when we talk about giving praise and glory to God, that doesn't mean that you have to kind of get up there and do your Pentecostal two-step and woo, you know, everything's all... 
oh my goodness, you know, and your, your arm pumps and stuff, you know, because I think that kind of conjures, conjures up that kind of a sense. There is a, a, a genuine and important version of what it is to genuinely give praise and glory to God. So uh, that means that your speech and actions, this is where it starts, your speech and your actions are honoring to the Lord. Okay, that's how we give praise and glory to God. It means that we are effectively and sincerely esteeming God above anything else. That's what is to give praise and glory to God. It shouldn't be covert, and it shouldn't be subtle, and it should be expressive. I mean, you're still kind of a normal person that would express themselves in any way a normal person would, but we are lifting up, and we're excited about an object, about something, and we want to give praise and glory to that, and we want to make that known. That's what the shepherds did, and that's what we are meant to do. You want to know who someone, you want to know why someone doesn't give praise and glory or want to worship God? The reason why somebody doesn't do that? And I don't know where I am in my notes to give you the answer to that. And that is a person who thinks that God didn't do anything worthy of it. That's the person who doesn't say anything. If, If you're not giving praise and glory and pointing to God, It's because for whatever reason, you don't think he's worthy of that. Maybe you think you did it yourself. Maybe you think you're doing pretty well. Maybe you achieved the things in your own mind that are a success. Now, the the, uh, shepherds, they at no point drew any attention to themselves. No, they could have. They could have said, hey, we're we're the fellas, we're the the guys that the angels appear to us. We're the ones. Isn't that incredible? Of all people, little old us, we saw the angels. You want me to tell you my story about when I saw the angels? They didn't do that. Everything was about giving glory and praise to God. The object of the message of the shepherds was Christ. And the subject of their praise and worship was with what they experienced. And I think it is so important that we understand what it is to give praise and glory to God because it takes some humility to do that. It's to recognize that it's all God. It's to recognize where we would be without him. And when you think about what God's done in your life, when you're thinking about where you've come from, when you look at the beauty of God being manifested in your life, that should cause you to say, well, I want to Give all praise and honor. That's because of God. That's because of God's word taking hold of me. That's because of the power of his Holy Spirit. And I don't want that to get, I don't don't want that to go unsaid because I want to make that truth known. And this is what the shepherds did. Experience is only perfected when we give God praise. So what I want to do this morning is I want to use this example I want to use this example of how the shepherds responded to experiencing God. And I just want to give you maybe my, my personal perspective on that as I reflect back through 2020. This year wasn't just another year. Uh, there, are certain, there are certain moments in life, I think this is true, there are moments in life that really define us. There are certain moments that as a Christian where you really kind of draw a line in the sand. There are different seasons that are of utmost significance in a church's journey or in a Christian's journey. And I think this has been a year where it's really required the church and Christians to determine or to decide what they will and won't stand for and what's important to them. And this world has gone through an event that has caused society society to rethink the way we do everything. We rethink the way we do learning. We've had to rethink what's important to us. We've had to reconsider where our commitment lies. Uh, This has been a year that has absolutely polarized Americans. Businesses have gone under. Uh, Many churches have permanently shut down not because they didn't want to remain open, but because of everything that happened, they were unable to sustain. Businesses are gone under, churches are permanently closed, family drama is at an all-time high. 
where loved ones are divided with what is right and wise. Like there are families that didn't get together for Christmas because of a different conviction about everything that's going on to do with COVID or even politics. The mental health of Americans has suffered greatly. Schooling has been compromised. Uh, The effect that the pandemic has had on our kids and young people is troubling. Uh, I mean, I'm sure you're all well aware of some of the data regarding suicide during the past year. There have been feelings of uncertainty, sleep disturbances, uh, anxiety, distress, depression. Okay, so that's what happened in 2020. It's been one of those years. And in the midst of this global ordeal was a local church family in the town of Escalon called Heritage Church. And by God's faithfulness, we close out this year united and blessed as a church. And it would be such a shame to not look back at what Jesus did and who he is and see what he did and make that known and give all praise and glory to God for what he's done in this church this year. God's faithfulness. We, you know, we, we close out this year strong. Some churches didn't weather the storm and my heart goes out to these people uh, COVID-19 maybe disrupted everyone, maybe beyond what we anticipated. And then then much of California was attacked by wildfires, just to double down on the inconvenience of everything and the loss and the suffering. And so that affected us here. We were trying to figure out how we were going to do service outside because of all the smoke. And then it was an election year, and that polarized the nation, and that made for a perfect storm for some riots and civil unrest. And as a church family, we had to navigate all this. So as we come to the end of 2020, this is our last service for this year. There's been unprecedented circumstances. Well, unprecedented in recent history, it's probably better to say. The church and Christians have suffered more persecution than we did last year. But it's been a difficult year. But we gather here this morning united and blessed. Oh, and let's throw in a name change into that mix as well. That's a big deal to change the name of your church, kind of in the thick of it. So we did that. And I know many of you have been impacted. I know many of you financially have been impacted. Loved ones that maybe are not feeling well. You haven't seen loved ones. In in the thousand different ways that you can be impacted by this type of a year, I know that some of you have suffered greatly. And, And I don't want to minimize that but I also don't want to minimize what God has done in this church this year and how faithful and good to us he has been. God's grace and mercy over this place has been obvious. And I'm just very thankful for what he has done. And so I take a leaf from the shepherd's book and I want to make sure that as we are on the heels of Christmas that we recognize It is all God. It is to his glory. He has done an incredible thing in this place, in this church. And uh, it wasn't anything that we as a leadership did. This wasn't anything to do with church strategy. This wasn't something we wrote up on a whiteboard and thought, oh, this is how we will get through the year. This is all God's goodness, grace, and mercy, and favor on this place. And we were undeserving of it, but um, we should all feel absolutely encouraged that we do sit here together celebrating the end of this year and that we stayed strong as a church family. I want to invite the worship team up. I believe that... uh, well, I'm thankful. I'm, I'm personally thankful. Now, remember, I, I, I started here as the pastor um, 15 months ago. Pretty much me and COVID all got here around the same time. <laughs> and I don't want you to put that together as if I had anything to do with it. 
And from the moment I've got here, and when I, I, I stepped into this role, I had uncertainty. I wasn't sure. I didn't know what I was walking into. I didn't know whether things were unstable. I didn't know. I was unsure. And so as we've gone through this year, I just want to say thank you for your encouragement and support, and that you did remain the church family, that you did rally around one another, that you did keep an eye on one another, that we did meet each other's needs. That is a very intentional thing that a church, need, church needs to do, and I really appreciate that you stepped up as the church. And that's got nothing to do with the pastoral team. It's got nothing to do with the oversight board or anything else that we tried to conjure up. This is because of your commitment to the Lord, because of what Christ has done in your life, and the fact that you wanted to give praise and glory to God and make these truths known. We are united and blessed, and I'm very thankful for that. So for all the good things in 2020, we attribute it to God alone. And what's amazing, church, is you have all had a front row seat to God's grace and provision in this church. And I hope that we don't ever forget this and that we don't forget our privilege and responsibility to give praise and worship to God and tell everyone who God is and what he has done in our lives. Let's close in prayer. So God, we close out 2020 um, lifting you up and saying thank you, recognizing that you are our king, recognizing that you are the pastor of this church, recognizing that it is the power of your Holy Spirit that is work in this place. And I thank you, God, that you have brought everyone into this church family that you have ordained to be here. May we make that known to everybody, your goodness. May we continue to give you praise and honor for anything that is good in our lives and in this, and in this church. We pray for another good year that as we go into 2021, that God, you would continue the great work that you're doing with each of us. I pray that everyone here is discovering something new about you and your Holy Spirit is empowering them with that truth. Transform us as believers more into your image. May we be an active church, a busy church, and may we be authentic, and may we be pleasing to you. And we pray for these things in your name, Jesus. Amen.